This is the lecture on ecological risk within the course ME 760 at the University of Waterloo. We're going to dedicate this lecture in this series to ecological risk assessment, and we are going to focus on emissions coming from mobile sources on road even though this full knowledge applies to stationary sources and off-road mobile sources. I'm going to introduce the basic concepts in ecological risk assessment, and these include points that we need to address when we are doing calculations, when we are collecting data for the risk assessment, and when we are interpreting the results from our risk assessment. Ecological risk assessment is composed of the idea of getting a source, which could be a stationary source or mobile source, seeing direct pathways, which is direct inhalation in humans and direct inhalation by animals, if you will, and indirect pathways. Most of the food web will be contaminated through indirect pathways. We need to assess and characterize the exposure from the ecological receptors from mobile or stationary sources. To do that, we need to select the habitat scenario. Let's say we have a road that goes through a national park. That road will have heavy-duty trucks. Ecological scenarios that we have, be it national parks, forests, it could be ecological areas where we would have marshes, it could be desert, but that's also ecological areas that need to be protected. We will represent the habitat by the food web that predominates in that habitat. And we're also going to identify the ecological receptors within that food web. And this is the process to conduct the risk assessment. The previous slide, we explained the exposure setting characterization. And then we need to define the food web that represents that habitat. The food web will not be including absolutely every animal. We need to select an animal that will represent other animals in the same categories. For example, if we have rodents in that food web, we can represent the rodent by a rabbit. So the rabbit will represent all the rodents. And if we have a carnivore, and we know the carnivore is represented better by a certain animal, then we will select that animal. Is that a mountain lion or is it a grizzly bear? So we will have to select that and develop the food web. Luckily, when we were developing the US EPA federal protocol, the screening level ecological risk assessment for air toxics, we defined a series of templates, a series of well-defined food webs that we can use for most cases, and we can also adapt that one and create our own food webs. And then we need to select assessment endpoints. What is the endpoint that will cause an impact in that ecological system? And we identify measures of effect. We will see that our identification will be very similar to the human health hazard quotient. And so it will be a ratio. And if it goes above a certain level, then there is a measure of effect that is a real negative impact. When we're defining our food webs, but we need to identify that food web who will represent the guild. And this I said, a rodent would be a rabbit as an example. The carnivore bird, it could be a falcon or it could be an eagle. We need to identify who will represent the carnivore bird in that food web. And then we organize the food web on trophic levels. So we have the producers, which are plants, do photosynthesis, and then we have the consumer, which would be trophic level two. Those are the herbivores. Above that, we have trophic level three, which will be the omnivores. And above the omnivores, we will have the carnivores. And then we have our dietary relationships within the food web. And here's an example of representative of the guild. This animal will represent the rodents, and this will be the reptile carnivore. 
We will not represent every single carnivore or every single animal in the food web. We need to have an idea of a food web, and that's why we call it the screening level ecological risk assessment. We may not have enough resources to count absolutely every single animal in an ecological location. So then we have a general idea and we conduct these studies. Concept of biomagnification. I have to tell a small story here regarding pelican. A long time ago, people would spray fields with pesticides, and the main one was DDT. DDT had concentrations that would be so small, people thought it was very safe. And then it would be washed from the soils, it would go to rivers and marshes. Algae would absorb that, but the concentrations again would be so small, no perceived problem. But I like to give the example of salt. We eat salt every day and we excrete salt from our bodies on a daily basis, maintaining an equilibrium. We're not accumulating kilograms of salt in our body, but we cannot do that with certain compounds. DDT is one of them. So the concentration in algae grows because algae does not know what to do with it. It stays in the plant tissue. And the concentration then in algae is higher than in the water body that the algae is growing. So then the shrimp eats the algae. The concentration in the shrimp will be higher than in the algae because shrimps will not eliminate that DDT. It will bioaccumulate. And therefore, as we go from trophic level one to trophic level two, and then the trophic level three, the concentration at the flamingo was, will be fairly high. It will not cause health effects directly on the pelican, but they would lay eggs, and the eggs would have a very weak shell. And as they are preparing to lay the eggs and warm them up such that it would crack and no baby flamingos. Similar thing happened to the bald eagle in the United States. DDT went through the plants. For example, rabbit would eat the plant, get more contaminated. Eagle would eat the rabbit and get even more contaminated. And they would lay the, the eggs, the shells would be weak, and they could not have baby eagles, almost went into extinction. So this is one of the reasons we need to understand biomagnification when we do our calculations, our mathematical models for ecological risk assessment. Biomagnification uses a property of these chemicals, and it's called a log of KOW. We addressed this on the fate and transport lecture. This is the octanol water partitioning coefficient. We don't address this directly because it changes many orders of magnitude. So we work on the log base 10 of KOW. High log of KOW indicates that the chemicals are lipophilic and they are low water solubility. These chemicals also must be persistent meaning they will not degrade over time, and the body does not know how to metabolize those chemicals. And therefore, they stay in the body and they accumulate from one trophic level to the next. Very important topic is allometric equations. We will not be able to test 100,000 different chemicals in every single animal in the world. So if we have to protect birds, we need to be able to test on an animal that's not very expensive and it's not threatened from extinction and propagate the information. Fortunately, along the, these animals, there is a strong correlations on metabolism, body size, body mass with surface of the body, etc. These correlations are very accurate. They're not perfect, but they are very accurate. So we can test chemicals on chicken and then propagate the reaction, the lethal dose, the doses that will cause health problems, etc., from the chicken to small birds or to the eagle without having to test these toxics in these animals. Same thing goes for mammals. We can test them on small 
and cheap to test lab animals and propagate all the way to cows and deers, top carnivores. I will cite here in this case an example on allometry to so just to review how this important this is. In the allometric studies, biologists detected that a mouse will live for about two years and the heart will pump about 1.5 billion times. A blue whale with a heart the size of a car will live 200 years and the heart will pump about 1.5 billion times, about the same amount as the mouse. If you have any questions, please do not feel shy to email them to me. Thank you very much.